I want to talk about um, uh, division of labor very quickly and then about the origin of uh, money and then the following lecture will be on uh, theory of banking. So you have the uh, enjoyment of uh, uh, hearing four lectures uh, from me today. I, I work myself to exhaustion, I guess. Um, let me start out with the question, why is there division of labor at all rather than people remaining in self-sufficient isolation? And in order to answer this question, we can go through a quick thought experiment. Um, assume for a second um, that all people would be perfect clones of each other. Every person is perfectly identical to everyone else. He knows exactly the same, he has exactly the same tastes, um, and, um, uh, and so forth, so no difference. And in addition, we assume that uh, land, that is the nature-given resources that every person finds in front of himself, are also perfectly identical. So if I have a tree standing in front of me, you have the same sort of tree standing in front of you. If I have a river running by the tree, you have a river running by the tree, and so forth. Um, in this case, in this world, we could anticipate roughly what will happen. Every person will produce exactly the same things in exactly the same quantities, um, in exactly the same qualities. Uh, he will use up the goods in exactly the same uh, pattern as everybody else and clearly in such a situation there would be no purpose uh, in engaging in any division of labor. As a matter of fact, what would there to exchange? Uh, perfect, perfectly identical oranges for perfectly identical oranges and so far. Uh, so the first insight is division of labor becomes only possible in so far as these assumptions that I just made about people being perfectly identical and land, nature given resources being perfectly identical are not true. Um, division of labor only makes sense insofar as there exist differences between individuals and differences and or differences uh, in land. Now even if this is a case, however, it is not necessary that people will engage in division of labor. They might still decide I produce everything on my own. Why don't they do that? They obviously don't do that. And the answer is, of course, um, because division of labor and then exchange based on division of labor is more productive than production uh, that is conducted in a self-sufficient uh, way. And there are two reasons for the higher productivity um, of, uh, of labor. Um, or put it this way, we don't have to assume that people engage in division of labor because they like each other or they love each other or they have sympathy for each other. We can even assume that people, every person hates everybody else and can still explain why division of labor arises because of the higher productivity of division of labor. That is, for purely selfish reasons, people will not remain in self-sufficient isolation. And the two reasons are, the absolute advantage of division of labor, namely the fact that some people, due to their own talents or due to the circumstances under which they operate, um, have certain advantages in producing one thing, and other people, due to personal talents or due to the fact that they are at special locations, are especially good at something else. And since time is always scarce, then it is advantageous if I specialize in those things in which I'm particularly good and you specialize in those things in which you are particularly good and then the total quantity of goods produced in this way will be higher than it would be if we both had decided to produce both things on our own. And then there exists the comparative advantage of division of labor uh, which refers to the situation, the worst case scenario, one person is all around more efficient and another person is all around less efficient. Uh, does it make sense to engage in division of labor even under this conceivably worst case scenario? And again, the answer is 
yes, it does make sense under this uh, situation too, um, provided that the all around more efficient uh, person um, specializes in doing those things where his advantage is especially great and the all around less efficient person specializes uh, in those things where his disadvantage is comparatively smaller. Um, if they do this, then again the total amount of goods produced will be higher than it would, have, would be if both of these individuals had decided um, to uh, do both things themselves. To give you an example, let's say uh, I'm a surgeon and the second person uh, is a gardener, but I as a surgeon am also a better gardener than the gardener is. Um, but my advantage is greater in the area of surgery. The gardener would kill uh, most people that he uh, conducts surgery on, whereas I rescue some of, uh, some of the people. Um, but in this case, my earning power being, so to speak, far greater if I'm active as a surgeon, it makes sense that I spend all my time as a surgeon and hire the other person as a gardener, even though I could do gardening better than the gardener himself can do. Again, the total amount of goods produced will be higher than it otherwise would be. Um, so division of labor is always advantageous who, for whoever participates um, in it. And the result of this insight, so to speak, in the higher productivity of uh, labor and um, uh, under a regime of division of labor is the result that larger number of people can survive. Uh, division of labor can expand further and further, more and more diversity um, uh, can, uh, can develop among uh, different, different individuals and so forth. Um, you can easily realize that if you imagine what would happen to us if we would decide tomorrow that we will just stop engaging in division of labor and try to become self-sufficient uh, producers. Uh, then basically all of mankind would die out within a few weeks because as soon as we would run out of our beer that we have in the refrigerator, we would not be able to uh, brew new beer as soon as our uh, suit uh, wears out, we would not be able to produce a new one or it would take us 10,000 years to do so and so forth. Um, so now we enter, so to speak, uh, a, barter, a barter economy. People begin to trade consumer goods, uh, against other consumer goods, producer goods, against uh, consumer goods, um, and, uh, and so forth. Um, in a barter economy, however, we encounter a fundamental difficulty. Um, we can only trade in barter if uh, a double coincidence of wants exists. That is to say, if you have what I want, and uh, I have what you want. If we would live in a world of perfect certainty, um, where we always know exactly what people want, when they want it, how much they are willing to exchange for it, and so forth, then double coincidences of once would always be present. Indeed, we would have no problem at all. However, uh, we do not live in a world of perfect certainty. Uh, we do not know what people want, when they want it, how much they want, and so forth. And because of this, double coincidences of once are frequently absent. Um, and because we live in a world of uncertainty where double coincidences of once are frequently absent, uh, a third type of good comes into existence, uh, namely money. To put it differently, under conditions of certainty, a good such as money might not come into existence at all. Uh, the necessary requirement for the emergence of money is uncertainty. What do people do if they have produced for exchange purposes, that is not for their own personal use, but in order to exchange their goods 
for something else, but they cannot directly trade because a double coincidence is, uh, of once is absent. I have something that I want to sell, but what I want to acquire, that person uh, happens to uh, dislike what I, have, uh, what I have to sell. In this case, it is initially only necessary that we have one bright person in society who makes a very simple observation. And this simple observation is um, there exist goods in barter um, that uh, differ insofar as some goods have a high degree of marketability. That is, they are used frequently by many people at many occasions. And there are goods that have uh, a lesser degree of marketability. They are used by lesser number of people at lesser occasions and so forth. Um, what can I do then in a situation where I'm stuck and cannot directly trade? Then I can just simply look out for individuals that have goods that have a higher degree of marketability than the good that I want to sell. So let's say I'm a fish seller, can't sell my, f and want to have pears, cannot get pears directly because a pear seller does not want fish. I'm looking out what other goods are out there that are highly marketable. I discover apples are highly marketable goods. Mm -hmm. Then I all only need to find one apple, buy, one apple seller who might be willing to take fish. And even if I myself dislike apples, I don't want to use apples as consumer good, nor do I want to use apples as a producer good, I'm allergic to apples, I still gain an advantage if I sell my fish for the, for the apples because the apples have a higher degree of marketability than the good that I surrender, namely uh, fish. I have in this situation demanded the apples not as a consumer good, not as a producer good, but as a medium of exchange, as a good to be used for the purpose of reselling it in order to get what I really want, namely the pears. And the reselling of apples in order to get the pears is of course easier than selling the fish in order to get the pears because there are more people who are willing to accept, um, accept apples in exchange. Now then the degree of marketability for apples increases. Uh, it has been a marketable, highly marketable good from, uh, from the outset on. And now there is an additional person who demands apples to be used as a medium of exchange. Um, so for the next person to be in the same situation where he cannot directly acquire what he wants to acquire, to make the same observation becomes already easier. He also looks, all I have to do is just find somebody who has a highly marketable good, good more likely now apples, and I also try to sell my good, whatever it is, uh, uh, against apples to be used again for the purpose of reselling the apples in order to get whatever I want. The degree of marketability of apples increases even further, uh, and so forth. For the third person, the same discovery becomes even easier. For the fourth person, it becomes still easier, and so forth. And sooner or later, we have uh, more or less all people in society uh, demanding apples uh, to be used for this purpose as a medium of exchange, and we call that then a common medium of exchange. And a common medium of exchange is the definition um, of, uh, of what a money is. The characteristic of such a common medium of exchange would be it is the most easily saleable of all goods and it is the most widely acceptable of all, um, of all goods. Um, in principle, economic theory does not say anything about what goods will be selected for this purpose as a common medium of exchange. And historically speaking, all sorts of things 
have been functioning as, um, as money. We can only say a few general things about money characteristics, characteristics that goods must have in order to make it more or less likely that they will be chosen as uh, money. Um, they, must, uh, they must be obviously goods that are divisible because we want to use them for making small purchases and, and, uh, and large purchases. Um, so divisibility is an important uh, criterion. Um, secondly, they, they must be portable. That is to say, they must have a relatively high value per unit weight. Lead would not be making a good type of money because uh, if you would want to buy a car and pay with lead for, uh, for the car, we would need a truck in order to go to the grocery store and, uh, or the car dealer and buy, um, uh, buy the object that we, uh, that we want. Um, they must be... Um, uh, they must be easily uh, recognizable. Um, this is, it should not be difficult to find out, is this really the good that somebody says it is? And they must, of course, have a certain amount of durability. Uh, eggs would not be a very suitable candidate for uh, a common medium of exchange because if you take your eggs to the market, you might have scrambled eggs running down your, uh, your legs before you ever get to the, uh, get to the market. Um, but in principle, all sorts of things can uh, conceivably become money. The most uh, famous example that, uh, uh, that used to be given in economic textbooks is the example of, uh, of cigarettes becoming money in uh, in prisoners of war camps, uh, you get uh, packages sent there, uh, some things you want to use yourself, other things you realize you have no use for it, you want to engage in exchange, you cannot always directly exchange. Now you are looking again for something that is highly marketable. Uh, cigarettes have this characteristic, they are, uh, they are scarce, uh, they can be sold in packages, in, in cartons. Uh, in, uh, in single cigarettes, uh, and uh, sm as smokers know, uh, uh, when you run out of cigarettes late at night, uh, you can also make, and you are too lazy to go to the store, you can even distinguish between uh, uh, short butts and, uh, and longer butts. So these would be the, 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 the small change that you, uh, that you have, uh, have at hand. Um, and they are, of course, also easily recognizable and so forth. Nowadays, I'm not sure if uh, cigarettes would still be used as money because most people might, uh, might throw them out as being no good at all. Um, so maybe it would be bean sprouts nowadays that would develop in, uh, as money in, uh, in prisoners of war camps. But in the good old days, um, uh, cigarettes did this. The second thing that I want to emphasize is that whatever it is that does develop as a common medium of exchange, it must have initially been um, a valuable, indeed highly marketable good in barter. That is to say, we cannot start out the development of money with worthless pieces of paper. That is the type of money that we currently, uh, that we currently use. Just imagine, for instance, that I would uh, want to buy some valuable good from you and I have nothing uh, to offer that you would find acceptable and then I would just tear a piece of paper and write ten dollars on it and then ask you if you would be willing to accept this. Of course you would say uh, you must be crazy and even if I would add another zero to it say okay I, I add my um, bid to a hundred dollars that would make uh, that would make no, uh, no difference whatsoever. So at the beginning of the development of money, there must be a com what we call a commodity money. The second important insight as far as money is concerned is the following. In one regard, money is different from consumer goods and producer goods in one very important respect. 
when we ask the question, what is, so to speak, the optimal supply, the best supply of consumer goods that we can have, then the answer would be always, oh, yeah, the more we have, the better we are off. Um, when we ask the same question with regard to uh, producer goods, the answer is the same. Pro producer goods are, after all, nothing else but instruments in order to produce consumer goods. So the answer would be also, the more producer goods we have, the better off we are. Um, when it comes to money, however, this is not true. Um, and a simple thought experiment can help us to convince us of this. Uh, again, recall, the purpose that money has is to be a facilitator of exchange. We don't use it as a consumer good. We don't use it as a producer good. We just use it in order to, uh, as easy as po in an easy way as possible, to acquire consumer goods or acquire producer goods. So assume uh, the money supply is doubled overnight. Uh, but nothing happens to the quantity of consumer goods and producer goods in existence. Then the question is, are we richer because of this? And the answer is, no, we are not richer because of this. Uh, prices will by and large double. Prices expressed in terms of money, but our standard of living depends on the consumer goods and producer goods uh, that are in existence. Um, the same in reverse. Let's say the money supply falls in half from one day to the next, but again, nothing has happened to the consumer goods and producer goods. Then the question again, are we poorer as a result of this? Uh, and again, the answer is, no, we are not poorer as a result of this. We just have as many consumer goods and producer goods as before. What now will happen is, by and large, nothing else, but that the prices will, by and large, and I will have to say something about that immediately, uh, will tend to fall in half. Um, so when it comes to money, we can say uh, any quantity of money uh, is equally good as any other quantity uh, of money. More money is not better than less, than less money. Um, however, as I said, we have to make a little amendment to this, uh, to this insight, because if that would be all there is to say about it. It would be very difficult to explain why there is ever uh, a constant attempt to increase, uh, increase the money supply. Uh, and the amendment is this. Um, uh, while an increase in the money supply cannot increase the overall standard uh, of living in society, it can redistribute income and wealth within society. It can make some people richer and it can make other people poorer without making both of them together in any way richer. Um, how does that happen? Um, now, assume uh, we have uh, uh, find ourselves everybody's money supply has been doubled overnight and consider just two individuals who react differently to this discovery. The first person upon the discovery immediately rushes out and spends his newfound money on various things. Then some prices of some goods will rise those on which he spends his additional money. Not all goods prices rise instantly. It depends on, so to speak, on uh, what are the goods that are bought by various people with these additional supplies of money. This person who rushes out immediately begins to buy at the old low prices and then various goods, the goods that he buys, begin to rise in price. Um, now consider the second person. The second person might decide, uh, no, yeah, I'll think about for two weeks what I'm going to do with these newfound fortunes, and then I'm going to enter the market. Now after two weeks he enters the market, what will he find? He will find that many goods have already risen in price due to the fact that other people had rushed to the market sooner than he had. Um, so who will then be wealthier, so to speak, and who will be poorer as a result of these two different decisions? And the answer is the person who spent the money first 
will have enriched himself at the expense of impoverishing the other person who spent his money later on. In reality, of course, uh, additional supplies of money do not come into the hands of every person at the same time and this, to the same degree. In reality, money always enters the market at specific points. They are always more or less the same people who are the first ones who get the new money supply. And if we look at the present world, I have not quite explained yet how we get to the present world, but if you look at the present world and ask yourself who is always the institution that gets the new money first, the answer is of course it is always the central bank, the government or its, its central bank that gets the new money first, spends it first, then the, the, the uh, 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 most important clients, that is the commercial banks, will be the next ones, and the biggest clients of the commercial banks will be the next ones who get it. Um, and who does the money, who gets the money relatively late in the game are those who are on fixed incomes. Um, that, is as, that is to say, uh, governments and their uh, uh, closest clients will enrich themselves by always being the first ones who get the new money at the expense of those who get the money very late or not at all, uh, those who are typically on uh, fixed income. So here we have a motive, so to speak, why one would want to cause inflation, because inflation does uh, redistrib redistribute income without enhancing the overall standard of living um, in, um, in society. Um, the, next, uh, the next point I, um, I need to make is that under uh, a commodity money standard such as the gold standard or the silver standard, um, not as, uh, as an economic law but as an economic regularity, we could observe the following tendency, uh, for which there exists plenty of empirical evidence. Um, under the gold standard, um, for instance, during uh, most of the 19th century, um, uh, prices uh, generally tended to fall from year to year gradually by a few percentage points. Just as we nowadays are used to prices will go up from year to year somehow, so the expectation in the 19th century was, you know, milk is a, a gallon is one dollar now, next year it will probably be 95 and then it might be 90 and so forth. The reason for, uh, for this phenomenon, if you want to very simple explanation is something like this. If this rectangle, so to speak, indicates the size of all uh, consumer and producer goods, then under uh, a secularly growing economy, you get from year to year some sort of an increase in the size of this rectangle. Um, that is simply as a result of secular growth, um, which took place for hundreds of years, at least in the Western world. On the other hand, here you have gold, which is used in order to buy up uh, this quantity. And, and gold discoveries only, with, with a few exceptions, uh, added a teeny amount uh, to the pre-existing quantity of gold. So if this increases uh, quite a bit, this increases a teeny bit, then the prices expressed in terms of gold tend to fall. Um, the question that some people then have is, is it possible that businessmen can make profits if uh, prices have a general tendency to fall? The answer is of course businessmen can make uh, profits under, um, under those conditions because profits are the difference between selling and uh, buying prices, and if all prices generally fall, then of course the difference between selling and uh, buying prices must not be affected at all. In, even nowadays in an environment where most prices rise all the time, we have of course sectors in our economy where prices do fall from year to year. And just look at the electronics industry. Com if you know that you buy a computer next year, 
you can almost bet your life on the fact that it will be cheaper than it is this year. And if you buy it in three years, it will still be cheaper. Uh, the same with TVs and so forth. Um, and th this is obviously not an indication that the computer industry or the TV industry is doing particularly bad. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they seem to be uh, at least as profitable as, uh, as most other areas in, uh, in the industry. And what is the reason for that? The input factors that go into the uh, production of uh, computers also become uh, cheaper, so the profit margin uh, will not be affected by this, uh, by this at all. So, uh, one additional point I need to, need to add, um, we had initially, of course, a multitude of different types of monies in existence. Um, but, as trade begins to emerge between different regions, that are on different monetary standards, uh, there is also an automatic tendency that uh, one money or two monies will outcompete all other monies, and in the end we remain with one or two types of money in, uh, in existence. The explanation for this is, uh, again, quite simple. First, the expansion of the division of labor, I already explained. Uh, division of labor is advantageous. Uh, the ultimate uh, solution to that would be that the entire world becomes part of the, uh, of the market uh, and is integrated in division of labor. In parallel to that, we would expect also this tendency for one or two types of money uh, developing because, again, recall, the purpose of money is to facilitate exchange, to make exchange as easy as possible. And if you have a great multitude of different monies, then you are still in a system of partial barter. Uh, in order to buy at some other place, I first have to find somebody who wants to exchange X money against Y money, and then I can make my purchase. And it would be obviously advantageous if I can directly use whatever money I use at any other place um, in the world. So, from a point of view of economic theory, we would expect three things to be in existence. The first thing is a commodity money, such as gold and silver. Secondly, an international commodity money, a money that is used more or less on a worldwide scale. Um, and the third expectation, not purely theoretical, but based on empirical uh, observations, would be uh, that we would expect a money to be in place that by and large increases in purchasing power over time. That is, uh, that, uh, that we have a tendency for prices, uh, the, le the level of prices to general fall in the course, in the course of time. Now, if we... Uh, contrast uh, our theoretical expectations, so to speak, with the real world, we find the real world does not correspond to this at all. Um, in the real world, we find instead, first of all, there is no commodity money in existence anywhere. Um, since 1971, the entire world is on pure paper money standards. Um, no money in the world is redeemable into anything. The only thing that they redeem is if you have a crumpled uh, krona note, then they will give you a freshly ironed one. That's it. Um, the second observation that we make, there's no such thing as an international m money anymore in existence. There are uh, numerous freely fluctuating paper currencies in existence. Uh, and the third observation that we make is instead of having money that increases in purchasing power of money in the course of time, we have money that loses purchasing power in the course of time. So what is the explanation for this? And the explanation for this is uh, governments. Um, governments are unique institutions. Uh, they are different from any other institution um, insofar as a um, uh, insofar as they uh, can acquire their income in a coercive or compulsory fashion. Um, 
they finance themselves out of taxes instead of voluntarily paid uh, contributions for services that they offer that people can accept or uh, refuse. Um, governments do not come into existence because people said, tax me, tax me, tax me. Um, they come in existence despite the fact that people say, don't tax me, don't tax me. Uh, governments also grow, not because people like their services more, uh, say just tax me more, tax me more, I'm so happy, so happy, so happy. Um, they grow despite the fact that people might be increasingly unhappy about what they do. And governments, unlike whatever GM or Ford, also do not go out of business because people just simply say lousy product, lousy product, lousy product. They still stay in existence even if everybody screams in the top of their lungs that they think they only get lousy products from, uh, from them. So they are a very unique type of institution. Um, they are always on the outlook of increasing their income beyond what they can uh, milk the taxpayers. Um, and what other sources of income can they possibly come up with? And as I will explain, uh, the other way of increasing your income besides taxes, tax, raising taxes sometimes is dangerous. People have been killed trying to raise taxes. Um, is to uh, gain complete control over the production of money and become uh, uh, a monopolistic money counterfeiter. So how do governments do this? And all governments have done that. They all have gone through the same steps at different times, but the step, the order of the steps always has to be roughly the same. The first, the first step, I have to explain how the gold standard worked, so to speak, you had competition in, uh, in minting. That is, different people offered their coins, uh, competed in terms of beauty and quality and so forth with each other. Um, then we had, um, uh, uh, besides genuine money, we also had what is called money substitutes in existence. Money substitutes are nothing else but uh, tickets, uh, titles to money. If people put gold in the bank, then they get a ticket from, from the bank that uh, certifies you as the owner of this uh, gold that you deposited there. And at uh, uh, presentation of your ticket, you can uh, get your gold out and people might be willing, if they trust the whole scheme, uh, to accept these money substitutes as payment uh, just as they would accept money itself. Uh, this is why uh, people were first willing to accept pieces of paper as payment. Uh, recall, I explained before, nobody would accept a piece of paper as payment initially. The only reason why people ever accepted a piece of, pa piece of paper as payment was that these pieces of paper were not just pieces of paper. Uh, they were just titles to money that was sitting, uh, sitting in the vaults. Um, and um, so there existed also uh, uh, competition in the production of money substitutes. Different banks offered their own substitutes. Bank A, Bank B, Bank C and so forth uh, printed these tickets and you could then go to Bank A, Bank C and D and get the gold out that, uh, that was stored in these places. Um, and, um, um, and the three steps, this is so to speak the beginning the starting point from which governments must begin with their, uh, with their evil works, so to speak. Uh, what do they do first? They first, they, they monopolize the minting. Um, 
They say, only I can mint gold. No competition in this area anymore. How did they just sell that to the public? They told the public, you can't trust these capitalists. I mean, they might just so they might just write there, this is an ounce of gold, and in fact it is uh, t tens less than an ounce, or they write down it's 90% fine, and in fact it's only 80% fine, and so forth. Everybody knows that uh, capitalists are crooks, but governments, of course, as you all know, are honest from beginning to end. So uh, please give us the right to... to monopolize this. It should be perfectly clear that it is precisely competition uh, that is a powerful reason for businessmen to remain honest. Uh, imagine that one of these minters, minting companies, would miscertify what the gold coin is ab all about. This would, if this would be discovered by some of the competitors, it would be immediately pointed out and the company would be broke in no time. Uh, what protects you from whatever uh, tuna fish producer uh, to put cat food into, into the tuna fish cans? To a large extent it is other tuna <coughs> fish producers who would just look at this and say, hey, look, uh, company XYZ, they say it's tuna fish, but I have uh, analyzed it, it's basically cat food. Uh, then the company would be broke in, uh, in no time. I'm not saying that competition makes it impossible that fraud occurs, but competition is a powerful instrument in order to make fraud less likely to occur. What occurs, however, once you monopolize it? The answer is, now it is, of course, far easier to, to do the thing that governments blame uh, private entrepreneurs to do. Um, what they now do uh, is frequently then one guy dies, the next guy comes to power, he calls in the, the, the coin, says that my predecessor was an uh, ugly looking guy and I'm so pretty, I want to melt it down, put my face on it and I'll give you the same number of coins back that you turned in. And in the course of it he subtracts 10% uh, of the gold content, mints 10% uh, more coins each one gets the same number of coins back, but each coin has 10% less gold than it previously had. The additional 10% coins the king or whatever appropriates himself. He thereby enriches himself at the expense of, um, uh, of the rest of uh, the public. We call that coin, coin clipping. Has occurred in the course of history over and over and over again. But you cannot do that day in and day out. People are stupid. Uh, as we all know, but not all people are stupid all the time. Uh, so they catch on eventually to this. You can do that maybe once a generation, but not every second week. Um, so what do you do next? The next thing is you, you monopolize the issue of money substitutes. And you argue in the same way. You say, look, these banks that issue these money substitutes, what prevents them from issuing money substitutes that are uncovered by anything? They simply print identical tickets to the other tickets, except they have nothing to back up these tickets. What prevents banks from doing this? Um, and again, these are evil entrepreneurs, evil, evil businessmen. Of course, they are all to defraud you public. Um, and um, because of this, you have to turn to the only trustworthy organization that is out there, that's the government. Uh, we will certify this from now on. Again, the same argument applies, of course, that I already uh, out outlined. Uh, if a bank would indeed issue money substitutes that are uncovered by gold, this would be a field day for any competitor. They would point that out. And if they point that out, you can count on the fact that there will be immediate bank runs ensuing on that bank. Uh, then people would know, ha ha, they have more tickets out there than they have gold in the vaults. So only the people who go there first will be able to get their money out. Um, and, uh, and the bank, of course, is unable, uh, unable to pay. I'll take the questions afterwards, okay? Um, once it is monopolized, what government blames businessmen to do is, of course, again, far easier for itself to do. It is to print additional 
tickets that look exactly like the other tickets. Nobody can tell the difference, but they have no gold. And what does then eventually occur, despite all the trust that people have towards their government, is bank runs will occur. In the United States, that began in the late 1920s, early 1930s. Bank runs occurred, lots of banks gone bankrupt and so forth. And what does the government then do? Then they say, hey, hey, now we cut the tie between the paper and the gold. Generous as we are, you can keep the paper and, uh, and we keep all the gold that you deposited in, um, in the banks. Uh, gold ownership is now illegal. It was illegal in the United States until the 1970s. Um, and everybody who still has gold at home ha is obliged to turn it in. He gets, again, generous as the government is, paper tickets for it. Um, and uh, those who do not will be um, um, are, are subject to criminal, uh, criminal, punish, criminal punishment. From that moment on, paper can float on its own. Because by that time, paper has acquired purchasing power. People know what you can get for the paper. And because of that, it can now, even after the tie has been cut, continue to function as money. But now you are, of course, in a position uh, where you can, at least on the national level, inflate at will. You don't have to redeem anything anymore into anything. Uh, that is like, I'll give you the monopoly. You are the printer of US dollars. Everybody else who does it is a criminal counterfeiter. So what will you do? And the answer is, of course, you will, pr you will start printing immediately. Uh, you can buy yourself a Mercedes with it, uh, cost you almost nothing, then you pay off your mortgage, then you will find out you had more friends than you ever thought you had. Uh, you all come and want to have your, use your magic wand as, uh, uh, as well. Um, and uh, in reality, that means, of course, these central banks employ uh, tens of thousands of economists uh, whose job consists in just uh, throwing dirt into your eyes, just explaining to you how important it is to print up additional money, that you can make the world richer by printing up money. Let me just give you this argument, how idiotic this is. This, which you read in the paper every day, money supply should be increased, liquidity should be increased. Now, if you could make the society richer by doing this, then ask yourself, why in the world is it that there is still one country that is poor? Why in the world is it that there is one country that is, st one person that is still poor? Even one horse countries can just print as much money as they want. Uh, we should long live in the Garden of Eden if this could be done. That we don't live in the Garden of Eden indicates clearly that printing paper money is just pr printing more toilet paper. That also does not make you in any way uh, richer. So now there is still one problem that remains in existence, um, and that is now you have these different national paper currencies competing against each other. And if one country inflates faster than the other, what happens is their currency will fall in the currency market against others. Now, sometimes countries like that for a certain period of time because it, it stimulates their uh, exports or something like this. But no country likes to see it that its own currency always continuously falls against other currencies. Because what is then the danger? That people will simply just abandon the home currency and, and hold, only, uh, hold their assets only in... Uh, uh, in currencies that, uh, um, that, are more, that are more stable. So what do you need to do in order to overcome this problem? Now what you need to do to overcome this problem, you see to a certain extent already in Europe with the creation of the euro, but I want to just give you the ultimate solution first and then say a few words about the euro. Um, the ultimate solution is of course we have to create a one world paper currency issued by a one world uh, central bank controlled of course by whom? By Denmark. 
Um, no, by the United States, of course. Um, after all, that's dominant uh, imperialist country, uh, which you can recognize by simply looking where, in what countries they all have troops stationed. All of Europe is, so to speak, occupied territory. From the point of view of the United States, you should hear the Amer Americans screaming if there would be uh, military parades of Spaniards and Germans and Frenchmen and uh, uh, Greeks and Turks go on and they have their, um, uh, their various depots and then um, every American would say, yeah, but then the, we are not a sovereign nation if, if that is the case. But all Europeans think they are still sovereign nations despite the fact that American troops are roaming around all over the place and, uh, um, and telling people what to do simply through their presence. Um, so this is, this is something that is actually underway. There are mighty organizations that have always promoted this idea, um, Trilateral Commission and uh, Council of Foreign Relations, for instance, are in favor of such institutions. And uh, look at the situation that uh, uh, has uh, taken place in Europe. Denmark, uh, to its credit, did not participate in this nonsense, but uh, you never know. Um, if they let you uh, vote on this uh, over and over again, until you come up with the right solution, you might eventually come up with the right solution also. Um, they have done that in the past uh, with you guys also. Um, they don't let you vote again if you just uh, come up with the right solution again and want to revoke it, but uh, if you have the wrong solution, then they let you vote again. Um, so what was the purpose of the European, of, in, in, of, of creating the Euro? The reason was precisely because of the reluctance of the German central bank to, yeah, to engage in the coordinated inflation that the European countries wanted to engage in. Now this has very little to do with uh, unique German virtues. Uh, that has just something to do with the fact that the Germans uh, in the 20th century it happened to be always on the loser's end. Um, and when twice through hyperinflation uh, and were extremely sensitive when it came to uh, inflation and uh, the central banks had to be somewhat less inflationary than the central banks in other countries uh, were. That was a constant complaint from various countries, Spain, France and so forth. The Germans don't really cooperate in our inflationary schemes. Our currencies are always falling against the German mark. That should not go on like this. So what would be the solution to that? Do we create uh, a European central bank in which the Germans are outnumbered? Uh, they're just uh, one of 12 or whatever it is. And then democracy will determine how much money will be created. And the result is, of course, that the euro is more inflationary than the least inflationary currency was uh, of those that were integrated into the euro. That was the very purpose. And then they used, of course, the argument that, yeah, but it also uses tra reduces transaction costs. You don't have to go to Italy and then exchange kronas for liras and then liras to, for French francs and so forth and so forth, which is all right. This is an all right argument, but you realize this existed, of course, precisely under the gold standard also. Um, that is, there we also had an international, uh, an international money. Uh, but an international money outside of the control of government, whereas now we would create an international money that is completely under control of governments. And now it is only a small step that is still left. Uh, we have to create something similar in the Pacific Rim. China is a problem. They might not cooperate. We have to do something about them. Uh, I'm sure uh, Mr. Bush has already some plans for for what to do with these guys. Once he's done with Iraq, then I think, and then Iran, th then maybe China will be the next. Um, and uh, and the, again, the weakest, uh, the politically weakest country, uh, and the economically most important country uh, in the Pacific Rim is Japan, 
Again, Japan is just also an occupied country, a loser country, just like Germany is a loser country. Um, so the loser countries, you can, of course, pressure more easily into agreeing to uh, things like this. And then one day we might indeed have the best of all worlds from the point of view of governments, namely uh, a world paper currency created by a world central bank with uh, rates of inflation that mankind has never seen before. That should be, that should be the talk on money. Thank you. And, and now I'm, I'm happy to take a question. Uh, considering the uh, free banking scenario where you said if banks engaged in fractional reserve banking uh, over issuing uh, money that is not backed up by gold, you would say they would quickly run out of business, but we have numerous historical examples of uh, free banking economies running a uh, fractional reserve percentage uh, close to zero, like the uh, Scottish uh, example in the 18th centuries. Um. As a matter of fact, because they were always bailed out. Um, so I think these historical examples that were given about the Scottish uh, uh, free banking experience is historically false. Uh, Murray Rothbard has written, it, first he wrote a relatively favorable, favorable re review of this uh, Selgin White book. Uh, on uh, the experience there, and then, uh, and then later on when he just uh, um, worked himself a little bit more into the history of, these, uh, um, of this episode, uh, he reversed his, uh, his judgment and, and found that, uh, uh, in fact, they were in constant difficulties and it was always the bailing out of the, of the central bank in, in Britain that prevented them from failing. Um, so I will, t I will say a little bit more about, about free banking um, in, in, my, in, my banking, in my banking lecture. I think free banking does have an advantage over central banking. That, that I agree. Um, uh, precise, not least because of the reason that, that I said if they are really operating without having some central bank standing in the background uh, ready to bail them out into, uh, once they get into difficulties. Um, so if it is really a free banking system as some of the free bankers claim, uh, then I believe they have to hold relatively high, high reserves. Um, and uh, because of that, advantageous over a system of central banking. Um, so you think that fractional reserve will recur, but not, you know, close to zero? Um, under, a f under a free banking system, um, it, it, that means uh, fractional reserve banking is by law permitted. Uh, it will occur, but it will have consequences. It will have consequences that it will cause business cycles. Uh, and it will cause eventual bankruptcies. Um, there might be even um, uh, there might be even a, a competition among them to just reduce their um, uh, to test, so to speak, how far they can lower their um, their reserves, and that then leading to some sort of yeah contagion effect and bringing the whole banking system down. That is something that, uh, that Guido Hülsmann um, might, uh, might be willing in one of his other lectures to make a few additional remarks about uh, as well. But let me, uh, let me first give my, uh, my lecture on uh, on banking, then maybe some of your uh, some of your questions will be answered. Okay. Um, you stated that um, the the government uh, gained the advantage of um, of uh, inflation. Uh, who gained the ad advantage of uh, deflation? Under the gold standard, you you said that. Uh, 
the the goods uh, will have a have a you know you have to use uh, less money to buy oh for the, under deflate now let's say now all the workers for instance gain gain tremendously from it I say like you, your your normal even if your nominal wage remains the same and prices fall all the time you get real wage increases all the time so there, there's nobody who gained the initial uh, advantage from the de from deflation nobody yes. gains an it yeah the initial advantage like uh, when you produce mm -hmm. more money the, the, the state gets uh, the initial uh, advantage you, 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 get, you get the advantage of that all, all consumers gain from it, all workers gain from it, and, and, uh, and, and businessmen are not hurt by it because uh, profit, uh, uh, profit margins uh, remain the same, and the whole thing is nothing else but uh, yeah, an expression that the economy grows, standards of living increase all around. I mean, Chicago economists, who always emphasize so much the idea that uh, we should have a stable purchasing power of money, um, have fallen frequently into the error to believe that the 19th century must have been a century that was characterized by and large by economic depression because prices generally fell through all of the 19th century um, until people of course investigated that and found that you know, as a matter of fact the 19th century was one of the centuries where we had the highest economic growth rates. It was a century where standards of, standards of living exploded. And America became the richest country in the 19th century most of the time during phases when prices fell. And what is so good about stable money? I mean, this, this is, I mean, this is one thing that you always have to just, when you talk to Chicago economists, first of all, it's very difficult to measure what is stable money. But even if we just leave that aside, um, what's so great about stable money? Um, look, you, you buy a house. Um, three things can happen to your house. The price of your house can go up, uh, the price of your house can stay the same, or the price of your house can fall. Um, w which situation do you like the best? Well, the price of the house goes up, right? Um, that's not stable. Um, so three things can happen with money. Uh, the purchasing power of money can go up, the purchasing power of money can stay the same, the purchasing power of money can fall. Which would you prefer? Purchasing power of money goes up. Uh, only if the alternatives are only purchasing power of money stays the same or becomes less, then, then you would say, okay, then I, then I take it stable. Uh, price of the house can stay the same or can fall then I'm in favor of it stays the same. Uh, but those are not the only alternatives. Purchasing power of money going up is great. We would not even, in, in that case, we would not even have to have these constant uh, renegotiations re of, uh, of wages. Um, look that every year, whatever, the employers and the employees sit together and what do we do about wages? Uh, inflation was such and such. Now, do we have to adjust that by this amount or that amount and so forth? In the 19th century, no such things was even necessary. You got automatic raises because purchasing power of money rose all the time. The nominal wage could stay the same and still you got richer every, every year without any no negotiations being necessary. Today, companies and people are able to do transactions in whatever currency they would like. So that you, you and I could potentially make a transaction in gold or whatever stable currency we would choose to do internationally across borders. How do you explain that good money, gold or anything else, 
has not yet forced out transactions still being done in fiat money. Even international corporations, when they deal with each other, they use fiat money as their basis for their transactions. Why aren't they using something else when they can? Well, your first uh, governments still insist that you have to pay your taxes in their money. So you must have you, you must have certain uh, uh, holdings in, in terms of of the paper currencies. It is also not the case that all courts. Uh, do enforce contracts that are made in other currencies. That might be the case in some places, but I'm not sure. Again, I'm not uh, familiar enough with the legal conditions on, in various places. Um, but I do know that it is not the case that wherever you make contracts um, in other than the so-called legal currencies that courts will enforce these. Uh, contracts. Uh, if they would, I think the pressure would be significantly higher, uh, for, of, you, of which you speak that good money drives out uh, bad money. Uh, but again, as I said, uh, taxes still have to be uh, paid in, in bad money, so there is of course a st still a significant uh, demand for, for bad money. So there are still legal tender laws in existence. Um, but I'm, one might be hopeful um, that, um, that the volume of, of transactions in, in good money uh, will increase, that, uh, that more and more legislations uh, or uh, legal districts will recognize uh, contracts made in terms of other um, uh, in terms of other monies besides uh, legal legal tender, um, and then I think indeed uh, what you what you predict and what economists generally predict that uh, good stuff will derive out bad stuff will occur. Yeah. You have this, as far as I remember, you have the thing called Gresham's Law saying that bad money drives out good money. Because if you have two monies and one is better than the other, then people will use the less superior money and keep the good money for themselves. Yeah, but only, on, only under conditions of price controls. Um, so uh, the Gresham's, Gresham's law is misunderstood when you, uh, when you don't emphasize that only if price controls are effect, in effect, then uh, bad money drives out good money. Under normal, so if there's no price control uh, in effect, then for money the same thing holds as for any other good, good stuff drives out bad stuff. Well, I believe he asked about the real world now. What? The question was about the real world, how it works today. So that would be an effect, wouldn't it? Yeah, but there are still price controls in effect. There are still laws in effect that, that require you to use bad money and so forth. Again, I'll see you after lunch. <laughs>